Hey everyone, um, I've got one last little thing that I want to talk about and it's just something that's interesting to me. You've probably heard a lot about and it's uh, common enough that I think it's important that we address in our biology classes and, and biology students need to be a little bit more informed about this sort of thing. But I also like this topic because it, it kind of addresses a, a root issue of, you know, things that, that have kind of permeated the whole class. And, and uh, basically, um, I want to talk about this question here. Do vaccines cause autism? Because there's, uh, you know, a common perception that vaccines are linked to autism. And therefore, there's lots of people who are against vaccinating their children. So do vaccines cause autism? Um, no, they don't. So that's, that's the, the main idea here. They do not cause autism. Okay. Um, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, but, um, you know, that's the hard stop answer right there. The consensus of the medical and scientific community is overwhelmingly that there is no link, but let's talk about this idea because this idea gets at an idea that I've talked about all the time in all my classes, which is, you know, I believe that there's no link between vaccines and autism. And other people believe that there is a link between the two. But why do you believe what you believe? And I want to talk about why I believe what I believe and, and talk about this idea. And so why do people think that there is a link between vaccines and autism. Again, the scientific and medical, com medical community is convinced that there's no link. The people who you know, do this every day. But why does this idea still persist? Well, again, it's an interesting thing and it's, it, it's, it's an interesting topic, but it's not limited to just this idea. There are all kinds of you know, ideas where there's lots of difference in opinion between the scientific community and other communities, uh, things like climate change and, and a lot of other things. And so this gets back to this central idea of why do you believe what you believe? And so it's an, you know, again, it's an interesting exercise in critical thinking skills. And I can't tell you what to believe, right? That's not my job. You have to decide what you believe. But it's my job as an educator to ask you, why do you believe what you believe? Because that's the important question. That's what gets at um, the heart of a lot of these differences of opinion. And if you have to, you know, in this world, you have to decide whose opinion to trust and why should I believe certain things? And so you need to ask yourself, what is the quality of this information. We live in this age where all the world's information is at your fingertips. As an educated person, you have to figure out, well, what is reliable information and what isn't? And why should I believe this information and not that information? And so that is an important skill for an educated person, for any person. But this is what education should be doing. This is what we're trying to uh, help you with is to teach you how to ask that question. So let's just start with some simple basic ideas. And this is just stuff I came up with. Things fall when you drop them, right? Do you believe this is true? I think most of us believe this is true, right? If you drop something, it's going to fall. Well, why do you believe that's true? Well, I mean, it seems like a silly question, right? But the silly questions sometimes force you to kind of that's the point, is to make you think about, you know, it's to think about thinking. Well, this one, everybody believes. If I drop something, it falls, right? Well, why is that? Because I have direct experience with that. Every time I drop something, it falls, right? Now, you know that if you are in the space shuttle or somewhere else, that this is not true, but none of you have ever been on the space shuttle, right? And you, you have direct experience with this. So, and it happens the same way every time. So it's just a sort of thing like, well, why do I believe this? Because I've never seen otherwise. Now you're probably familiar with, you know, theory of gravity and, and other explanations for why things fall, but you really just have direct experience with that. And that's not a bad thing. That's part of what every human does. Uh, 
you know, to help understand the world. Let me talk about something else that we believe. DNA makes RNA, makes protein. Now, do you believe that's true? I believe that's true, right? But why? Why do you believe that's true? Have you ever observed this? You know, you've dropped things and they always fall, but have you ever seen DNA make RNA make protein? Well, no, of course not, right? But you probably still believe it. Well, why do you still believe it, right? You know, I've never seen Australia, but I still believe it's there, right? It's what causes you to say that this is quality information. Well, um, you know, this has been determined through the process of science, right? Well, why should you trust the scientific community? What do those scientists know? Are there any examples where scientists were wrong? Yes, there are plenty of examples where scientists were wrong. But this is why we talk about the process of science in your science classes. You need to understand how science works and how it is a self-correcting process. And so, um, when you understand that science is a way of, of uh, again, it's a, you know, sci scientists make mistakes, but the process of science is designed to fix those mistakes. And consequently, over time, the information that you get from scientists can be trusted. And so things like DNA to RNA to protein, you've probably never worked in a lab. You certainly have never seen this with your own eyes, but you know how other scientists have come at this idea and you know how this idea fits in with other scientific ideas. And so you trust it more. Now you also understand the limits of science. You understand that science is only asking questions about the natural world. And this is certainly something to do with the natural world. And so all of that feeds into, well, why do you believe this statement to be true? Well, again, let's talk about that process of science. Why should you have confidence in scientific explanations about the natural world? This is, again, I, this is my favorite quote uh, from Marsha McNutt. Science is not a body of facts. It's a method for deciding whether what we choose to believe has a basis in the laws of nature or not. And so the common idea of a scientist in a science class is just oh, all these facts that you have to memorize. But that's not what science is. Science is a way of asking questions and answering those questions. And it's a way of asking if what we choose to believe has a basis in the laws of nature. So there's that, why do you believe what you believe? So you can believe all, you know, you, you, I'm not going to tell you what to believe, but I'm going to ask you to think about, well, why do I believe that? A classic example that we've talked about before is, um, where did all the species on earth come from? Now you may choose to believe that they were all created by a supernatural being a few thousand years ago. That may be right. That may be exactly where they came from. Now that's not a scientific answer and that answer, you know, that they were created by a supernatural being that does not have a basis in the laws of nature, right? It might be right, but it does not have a basis in the laws of nature. It contradicts what we understand about the laws of nature. Now, if you say all the species that we see around us all evolved from earlier species over a very long time, that answer does have a basis in the laws of nature. And that's what I believe because I believe in that science is a good way of finding those answers. But you may believe something else. That's all science is doing is saying, does your belief have a basis in the laws of nature? It doesn't tell you which belief is right. It just tells you if that belief has a basis in the laws of nature. So we've talked about the scientific process and you're familiar with it. And we're just going to go over it briefly again. Why do I have confidence in this process when it, we're talking about the natural world? Of course, a scientist has a hypothesis, right? Lots of definitions for hypothesis, but a good one is it's an explanation for a natural phenomenon. Here's a natural phenomenon. Why does it work? That's my hypothesis. Now, something that I think is often 
overlooked about the scientific process, but which is very important, is that the scientist who has the hypothesis and every other scientist starts out by assuming the hypothesis is incorrect. All right? Now, the scientist who came up with the hypothesis really deep down thinks they're correct, but they have to start by assuming they're incorrect. And then they have to collect evidence that that hypothesis is correct. And so they have to collect evidence that is able to change the other scientist's mind. Now, this is, you know, exactly the same thing we do in our courtrooms, right? When you go into that courtroom, you assume the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. So you assume your starting point is that they are innocent. They did not commit this crime. Then the prosecutor is like, well, what about this evidence? And what about this evidence? And what about this evidence? And they start putting all this other evidence in. And eventually the prosecutor is going to try to change everyone's mind. You all start by assuming they didn't do it. But then you say, well, this evidence suggests otherwise, and this evidence suggests otherwise. And then eventually, if there's enough evidence, okay, we change our mind, and we say the person is actually um, guilty. We actually assume they're not guilty. We don't assume innocence. You assume they're not guilty. And anyway, that's illegal. That's lawyer stuff. Anyway, you know, now, does the court system make mistakes? Certainly it does. But this is a way to try to limit those mistakes. And if you change your mind, you at least have a reasons for changing your mind. Well, it's the same thing with science, right? Science makes mistakes? Yeah, of course it makes mistakes. But we have reasons, at least, why we change our mind and why we make those mistakes. But the important philosophical point here is we start off assuming that this new hypothesis is wrong. And if you can't come up with any good evidence to support that hypothesis, it's going to stay wrong. No one in the scientific community is going to accept that hypothesis. And that is a, a subtle but very important you know, thing that makes science, um, again, it's just part of the scientific process, which to me gives me more confidence in it. Now, at the same time, you've got other scientists that are studying maybe the same phenomenon and they have their own hypotheses, but they're also doing the same thing, assuming they're wrong, collecting evidence. Over time, all these hypotheses that have the best evidence tend to stick around and hypotheses that don't have good evidence tend to go away. So science is a way of efficiently weeding out bad ideas. And that's another thing about science that you know hopefully gives you some confidence in the scientific results if you've got a bad hypothesis and you can't come up with evidence to support it it goes away in this way we have another saying science provides contingent knowledge not absolute knowledge so what does that mean contingent knowledge means what we say we know what we believe to be true today is contingent upon all this evidence that we've collected. However, if new evidence comes up that contradicts that, we'll change our mind. And so our knowledge is contingent upon what we've seen so far, but it can change if we see something new. Absolute knowledge says, this is the knowledge, this is the truth, that's it. We're not gonna change, it doesn't matter what you say, this is the truth. Now, that's a, just a different way of approaching the world, right? And they're, they're different, you know, people have um, respect this in different ways, I guess is one way to say it, right? But um, some, that again, that's just a different way of looking at the world. Hey, there is a truth, and I know it, and that's it. Accept it, you, you must accept that truth. Okay, again, why do you believe what you believe? Uh, and, and if that's the truth, well, why do you believe that's the truth? Whereas science is, is going to say, this is what we think is true, and this is why we think it's true. But if you show me, you know, enough evidence, I will change my mind. Now, we have something else we've talked about before. Uh, a lot of this process works out, you know, in, in many different ways. It's not a formal process. It's a very 
amorphous process, but you know, peer reviewed journals is one way that this works itself out, right? And so if you've got this research and you've done the experiments and you've collected the evidence, you're going to submit it to a peer reviewed journal. Now that journal is not going to publish what you've done until your peers have looked at it. People who are experts in the same field, who know a lot about that subject are going to really look at the quality of your research and it's a way of it's a process of quality control and they're going to ask questions about how did you collect your data and um, how did you do your stats and they're going to you know these are people that have competing theories competing hypotheses and so they are going to be very motivated to try to poke holes in your argument but if they are unable to poke significant holes in the argument then they'll say well we, you know this is something that should be published so it's it's a stepping stone um, you know to releasing information that a lot of other processes don't have so again it's why do you believe what you believe the stuff that we learn in our science classes has gone through this rigorous process of peer review which is hard to do and so the fact that that these things that get published they must have some quality to them that's why i believe in in things that go through the scientific process and it's an important part to the scientific process there are other things that people can publish other hypotheses that aren't scientific that don't go through this process and so you have to decide well should i believe these or should i believe the scientific hypotheses that have gone through this process again i don't know i'm telling you what i believe but you have to decide what you believe and why you believe it So let's get back to our original question. Why is it that people think that vaccines cause autism? Well, it is a study that appeared in a peer-reviewed journal. And so that gives it some legitimacy, right? Because of this rigorous peer review process. If this study that suggested this link did get published in a peer-reviewed journal. And so you start to think it has some validity. But this is a good example of science being a self-correcting process. This is an example of, um, you know, human fallibility, and it's not a perfect process. And this is a study that kind of slipped through the cracks. First off, this is the only study that has ever suggested a link between vaccines and autism. It's not the only study on vaccines and autism, but it's the only one that has suggested that there's a link. So there's lots of other studies that never found a link. This study had an end size of 12, a sample size of 12. They looked at 12 patients, all right, and made their conclusion based on these 12 patients. So you have to, again, why do you believe what you believe? You have to ask yourself, is 12 enough patients uh, to make a, an adequate study? A lot of people would suggest that no, that you need a much larger sample size to, to have convincing results. But this, the, the study that people base this idea upon only had 12 people in it. The study also did not use any controls, did not have a control group. And again, we've talked about this in class. You know, what's the important of, importance of a control group? It's something to compare your exper experimental group to. It's the basis of a good, solid scientific research. This research didn't have it, yet it still got published. Most importantly, the lead author did not disclose that the study was funded by lawyers who were interested in suing the producers of the measles mumps rubella vaccine so think about that there are people who want to you know there's there's a company that makes this vaccine there are lawyers who want to bring a suit against them and sue them for money for damages and so then they funded this study and then that study is the only one that ever showed that that vaccine is dangerous that seems fishy doesn't it um but the author, you know, that, okay, so the first, you know, studies get funded all the time and, and, you know, you can argue whether or not that funding influences the study, which of course it probably does, no matter what the study, but that's why you have to disclose who funded your study. Is there a conflict of interest? The lead authors did not disclose that. That's fishy. 
Also, the lead author had his had a patent on a vaccine that was a competitor to the MMR vaccine. So again, they had a reason to show that MMR vaccine was dangerous. All this was not disclosed to the journal that published this article. And so that is a again, it's an example of the peer review process failing, but it also failed because their people did not were not 100% truthful. And so it was a very fishy peer, you know, study that got published. And uh, but this is the study that people are claiming shows that there's a link between vaccines and autism. You may believe this study is is worth believing. I don't. And later, that study was completely retracted. And so enough people realized that there were enough problems um, and there was deliberate fraud involved that it's no longer considered a valid study. And so the one study that showed this link between vaccines and autism actually, kind of, you know, as far as scientific community uh, is involved, doesn't exist. But this idea got pounced upon and promoted by celebrities like Jenny McCarthy, reality stars like Donald Trump, who was just a reality star before he was president. And here is, you know, you can't say that he didn't promote this idea because here's the tweet in which he promotes it. Online bloggers, all these other people grabbed a hold of this one idea from this one discredited study, but have built this entire, um, you know, movement behind it. They may be right, okay? They, there may be a link here, but I don't think so, and most of the, the medical and scientific community doesn't think so because of all the reasons that I've ex, you know, explained before. And here are some specific reasons why I believe that there's no link between these two. Why do I believe scientists and medical professionals? Can they be wrong? Of course they can be wrong, right? Everybody can be wrong. Everybody's human. But this scientific process is a very good self-correcting process. And I understand how the process works and that gives me confidence in it. Another reason, how many people have studied this? You've got one study that shows this link and it's a very important, interesting problem. Tons and tons of other research has been done, none of which has shown a link. So that has to suggest that maybe there isn't a link. The most important question, and this is again, this gets to the heart of it, I think. What do scientists and doctors have to gain by hiding a link between vaccines and autism? That simply doesn't make sense. Why would there be this giant conspiracy of all the doctors and scientists in the world to say there's no link? What do people gain by that? Uh, there's, no, there's no good answer to that question. It simply is nonsensical to think that everybody's going to hide this link and pretend that it's not there. If, if it was there, people would want to find it out and no one's been able to find it. The one person who said they found it had a very bad study with deliberate fraud. And critics of scientists and medical professionals, again, they can make mistakes, of course they can make mistakes, but then if you criticize the scientists and the medical professionals, do you offer reasonable alternative, alternate ex explanations? And a lot of people say, oh, I don't believe that, or I think they're wrong, or those scientists don't know what they're talking about, but they don't offer a better explanation. And that's something that you should be watching out for. Um, it's okay to, you know, again, you know, I don't believe that. Well, why don't you believe that? I don't know. I just don't believe it. You have to understand, do you respect that? Do you respect someone who doesn't give a possible, plausible alternative explanation? Now, a lot of this has to do with conspiracy theories, right? There's a big conspiracy to hide this link. And of course we live in, conspiracy theories have always been around and we live in an age with where these things can catch fire a little bit easier because of the internet. And I'm fascinated by them. But I like to compare those to like scientific hypotheses, right? 
what's the difference between conspiracy theories and scientific hypotheses? Well, that you know, you can talk about this all day. But I think one kind of difference between the two, remember, scientific hypothesis says, okay, I'm assuming I'm wrong. I'm going to collect evidence to change your mind that suggests I'm right. A conspiracy theory says, I'm right, you need to prove me wrong. See the subtle difference there? The scientist says, okay, you know, let's assume I'm wrong, but what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And tries to convince you that they're right. The conspiracy theorist says, I'm right, prove me wrong. And that's a subtle difference, but it's an important difference. And if you do provide evidence to a conspiracy theorist, what are they going to say? Oh, well, you're just part of the conspiracy, right? The conspiracy theorist will always reject the evidence, will never reject the hypothesis or the theory. And so again, are, do, are the conspiracy theorists right? They might be right, right? You have to ask yourself, who do I believe? Whom do I believe? And why do I believe what I believe? That's what I keep getting at. And I can't tell you what to believe, but I can tell you why I believe what I believe and, and ask you to think about the same thing. Now, why is this whole idea of this link between vaccines and autism important? Well, because vaccines are important. And so I, I made this long before the COVID breakout. Hopefully we'll have a vaccine for COVID at some point. We can see what happens when you have a very bad virus that you cannot vaccinate against. It's completely shut down the world. But this slide was made in 2019 before we even knew about the COVID-19 breakout. And this was made in April 26th. So you look at this graph and this is measles cases, I think in America, in the United States reported by year. And you can see some fluctuation. But when I made this graph, it was only April and it already was the highest that had been seen in decades. And that's because people believe there's a link between vaccines and autism and they weren't vaccinating their kids. And, and you're starting to see outbreaks of these disease that we had virtually eradicated. And so, you know, this is a public health issue and people need to have good information about their public health. And so all I can ask you is to ask yourself, well, why do I believe what I believe? And we all believe different things and we all have to live together, but you need to constantly question your own beliefs and try to find reliable quality information. That's all I can ask. So that's all I got about this topic. Let me know if you got any questions. I'll talk to you later. See ya.